it's frightening You see right through the mess inside me And you call me out to put me um, So last week we studied Mark chapter 7 starting in verse 1 uh, through 13 and we observed some uh, very uh, important things in the ministry of Jesus, what we saw there was uh, an interaction between the Pharisees and some scribes that had come from Jerusalem uh, in their interaction with Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees were always and constantly trying to uh, outwit Jesus and, and, and capture him in a trap always trying to discredit his ministry and discredit his authenticity. Um, so when they showed up there, they had accused Jesus' disciples of not washing their hands before they ate properly. Now, the law of God required that priests wash their hands before entering into the tabernacle. There was nowhere in the law of God given to men or given to Moses where you had to go through certain ceremonial rituals to eat some food. But as I taught you last week, the, uh, the Pharisees had begun to build something that they called the tradition of the elders. In, in verse 3 of chapter 7, it says that they were not holding to the tradition of the elders, the Jews had begun to create their own traditional system to add on to the Word of God, to add on to God's law. This was a, an oral law that was passed on from rabbi to rabbi. And in fact, they, they called this oral tradition the fence around the Torah, the fence around the true law of God. And they said that this was supposed to reveal the intent of the law. The problem was is that as time went on, they continued to add more and more and more burden onto God's people that God never intended for them to carry. By creating this own, their own system, they made it almost virtually impossible to live your daily life. <clears throat> and so... They bring this accusation against the disciples of this ritual, this, this, uh, this washing of their hands, and Jesus rebukes them. In verse 6, when he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, he calls them hypocrites. Remember, hypocrite of this time was a common term, but not a derogatory term. The term actually meant for an actor in a theater that that would use different masks or disguises to play certain parts of a play, but did not actually have any uh, investment in the part. It was just a mask. There was no heartfelt, uh, you know, correlation with the part itself. And so Jesus rebukes them, and he calls them these actors. He calls them hypocrites. And he quotes from the prophet Isaiah here, <clears throat> When he says to them, the prophet Isaiah was right when he prophesied against you. That you honor me with your lips, but your hearts, your hearts are far from me. Your hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship, teaching the doctrines of men. In verse 8, Jesus says, you leave the commandments of God and you hold to the tradition of men. Adding to the Word of God, adding to the Bible, adding teachings of men, opinions of men, as if it represents God's heart Himself. This, my friends, is idolatry. This is breaking the first commandment of God and where it says, you shall have no other gods before me. 
But when you create in your own mind, you create in your own opinion who God is, what had happened is they had become a God for themselves with their own law. You see, God's law wasn't good enough. It wasn't crystal clear enough, so they had to come up with their own oral traditions to add on to the law to reveal what the intent actually was. This is a form of idolatry. You see, in the Bible, God has given us everything that we need to know about this life. Everything we need to know about Him and to know Him intimately and obey Him. We have no need to create no new book, no new form of laws or rules to be followed based on our own mind, our own experiences, and our own opinions. No, God has revealed Himself, and we must form our knowledge and our experience of Him based upon His Word alone. Period and Amen. Jesus closes this argument in verse 13 and he says, thus making void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down and many such things you do. And this still goes on to this day across the spectrum of denominational organizations. Whether you're a Baptist or you're a Catholic, you have certain traditions that you hold to. And some of them are good, and some of the intention is good, but let me tell you, a lot of it is a bunch of hogwash, a bunch of opinion of men. And it's not God-honoring, and it's idolatry. Don't ever stand for anything that says, well, the traditions of the church holds just as much credence as the Word itself. No, that sounds exactly like what we're reading here. There's no difference. Same thing. It's a disposition of the heart that we, we know better. We know best. We just need to add a little bit. So here we pick up in chapter 7, starting in verse 14. So please stand with me (coughs) for the reading of God's Word. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not into his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within Out of the heart of a man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within, and they defile a person. Please be seated and pray with me. Almighty God, I pray that this morning your words would speak forth from me. Lord, you would give me the ability to preach your word, which is holy, which means it is unique, and it is even scary for me to try and teach from it. But God, by your grace, I will stand here and do it. Lord, would your voice go forth? Would you divide our hearts and our minds? Lord, would you set us on the other side of this teaching, more holy, more after your heart, more in tune with your spirit, walking according to it, and saying no to the flesh. Let us bring honor and glory to your name by the very thread of our lives. I pray this, Father. Please hear my prayer. Please hear my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So what defiles a person? Here in verse 14, Jesus has called the people to him again. He's called the people to him again. And he said to him, 
He said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. You see, here Jesus is calling for everyone's attention. He he, is like, stop the train for a moment. He has found this accusation by the Pharisees and scribes as an opportunity to stop and say, wait a minute, all of you, pay attention and listen to what I have to say. For this is important. This includes us today. This includes us today. Stop and pay attention to what he has said. In this statement, Jesus, he wants all people to understand with crystal clarity in verse 15 that there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But it is the things that come out of you. It are the things that comes out of your heart that make you defiled. To establish the groundwork here, Jesus makes this dogmatic statement. Defilements come from within. So where and how are a person defiled? I asked that question, and let's answer it this morning. The things that come out of a man, the things that come out of a woman, the things that come out of a person, Jesus here is establishing, is what defiles. That is what defiles. You see, the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying. So often, they didn't understand his teaching. So, like the pattern we see, once Jesus and the disciples have gone on a little bit and they're now by themselves, kind of an inner circle. They ask Jesus to explain, please, explain. So if you're a disciple, I ask you right now, how often do you ask Jesus to explain things to you? When's the last time you bowed your knee in prayer when no one was looking, just you and God? You bowed your knees in prayer, and you said, Lord, I don't quite understand this. Would you please give me wisdom and insight into the text this morning? We should be doing that on a daily basis. I hear people, they come to me and say, I wish I understood the Word of God like you, or I wish that God would speak to me in such ways. And I always ask them, you tell me, when was the last time you got down on your knees and humbled your face before God and asked Him, please, God, show me the insight into this text and wrestle over it. And then this didn't get up after two minutes. There are things within the scripture that I have asked God about and some of them have it's been a year or more and one day God answers and it's crystal clear. That doesn't happen all the time. But I keep asking. We should always keep asking. If you don't understand a part of the text, ask God. He will show you. So here we see the disciples doing just that. Now they had Jesus face to face. We don't have that, but we do have him in truth, in presence, in his spirit. But they ask him face to face for some clarification. And so Jesus does. In verse 18, Jesus points out, number one, their lack of understanding. And then he says, do you not see whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Now we've got to stick to the context of what's going on here. It's very important. Jesus is dealing with ceremonial law. He's dealing with the facts of adding to the ceremonial law with the traditions of men, dealing a lot with things like food, eating certain things, eating certain things of the time of day, washing certain types of pots and pans. And so he's pointing out ceremonial law based upon food. When he says you eat and it goes into your stomach, it does not defile you. So if you've you got to stick to the context because if somebody read this, I've had people say this to me, you, you wouldn't believe. Awesome! 
Jesus says that no matter what we do, whatever goes into our body, it just goes in our stomachs expelled. So therefore, we can eat brownies laced with marijuana, and we can, you know, we can do this, and we can do that, because it just goes in our stomach, and then it's expelled. No, we cannot. We are not to have mind-altering substances. Just because it's edible doesn't mean it's profitable. Trust me, go eat some mistletoe and see how that works out for you. Not very good. I will tell you, disclaimer, do not try this at home, kids. It will kill you. Mistletoe is uh, poisonous. So anyhow, I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> this, um, this is far removed from what Jesus is dealing with here. This became very, 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 uh, <clears throat> very, very, very contentious debate in the early church when it, when it comes to eating, okay? So Jesus here, Mark puts in the parentheses, has declared all foods clean. All foods clean. This became a very, very contentious debate in the early church. And it took a long time for the disciples to even to, to start getting away from the oral traditions or even the written law. Mark adds to the verse 19 and says that Jesus declared all foods clean. There were certain dietary laws, kosher laws, that Jesus and the Jews held to. But when Jesus declared the foods clean, this began to change a paradigm. We see this in the early church still struggling in Acts chapter 10. Peter himself struggled with this. And also in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem church wrestled over this. And, and how should the Gentiles uh, be affected by some of these ceremonial laws? You can read about it. So in verse 20, he gives the point. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. Verse 21, Jesus taught with the authority of God. He reveals the true meaning of the law. This is why they got angry with him so often. Because, see, the Pharisees and scribes often would try to teach the interpretation of the law. But here Jesus makes authoritative statements like declaring all foods clean. You see, only God can do that. That's why it was so confusing to these Pharisees. Because either he was God or he was not. And they could not acknowledge the fact that he is God in the flesh. That's why they called him a blasphemer. That's why they wanted to kill him. For from within, out of the heart of a man comes what? What does Jesus say? What does he say that comes out of a man, out of his heart? Comes evil thoughts. What does the scripture say? Read it in your own Bible. What comes out of a man? Evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. Theft, murder, adultery, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Jesus again is pointing back to the Pharisees who on the outside looked clean. On the outside were morally straight, obedient to God on the outside with all of their rituals because they washed their hands looking like they had some form of piety. So Jesus is saying it's not the outward purity that God is concerned with. It is your heart. They were so busy with ritual cleansing, ritual ceremonial cleansingness that they ignored the more important internal, internal heart issues, the moral compass. The purpose here of the ceremonial laws was what? What was the purpose of God's ceremonial laws? It was to show the holiness of God. Do you know what holiness means? It means unique. It means separate. It means that God is unique within himself. There is nothing in all creation that is like him. He alone is God. Therefore, he is holy. So part of the ceremonial laws were to show the Jews that he is holy. And not only is he holy, they were to be separate as well. 
They were to eat separately than the rest of the nations who would what? Sacrifice their foods unto idols. That's what the purpose was. It was also, don't ever forget, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Memorize it. The purpose of the law was to teach, to instruct, to point to the need of a Savior. It was to point to the Savior Jesus Christ. That the only way to come to God and be accepted by God is through Him. So this is now about the acts of a heart. The acts of the heart. Verse 21, Jesus points to the actions and attitudes of the human heart. The first six nouns here are plural, which suggest repeated actions. Repeated actions. Look at the list. The actions are where? First. These actions are first birth out of evil thoughts. Does it not say that in your Bible? Evil thoughts, evil ideas. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. What does it say? It says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Look, there is a literal devil who hates you and wants to destroy you and take your soul on to hell to be burned forever. He hates God and he hates you. And therefore, there is temptation that comes through Satan and the world. But guess what? He has an ally. And that ally is your heart and my heart. Because it's from within your own desires. That's what James chapter 1 verse 14 through 15 says. That each person individually is enticed and lured when his own desire And when that desire gives birth to thoughts, you then give birth to sin. And when it's fully born, it gives birth to death. So the evil thoughts within a person gives birth to actions. What are those actions? Well, we see it here. Sexual immorality. That's the first one. And it's plural. Sexual immorality. It's where the the Greek word here is pornea. Pornea. And it means illicit sexual activity of various kinds. Illicit sexual activity of various kinds that are unlawful outside of marriage. Fornication. Two people who are unmarried illicit sex as if it's just a meal. As if it's just a need. As if it's just something like your back that needs scratched. It means nothing. There's no attachment. Where is that born? The Bible teaches it's born from within. It's born from within. Next, thefts. Thefts of various kinds. Stealings of of things that do not belong to you regardless of its value. Murder. You say, well, I've never committed murder, and I don't know anyone who's committed murder. Well, guess what Jesus said about murder? Jesus said that if you have angry with your brother without fault, it's just as if you've murdered them. You see, that's where murder comes from, is from an anger within that's uncontrolled. I think there would be a lot more murder if there wasn't the threat of being in prison for life or the death penalty. It just uh, scares me sometimes if you think about a society that with the restraint of government has taken away a period of time where the infrastructure of a society is removed. Then you will see real quickly the abilities of the human heart. Some people have seen it in war, seen the evil that can take place in an unstrained, unrestrained environment where the human heart is left unleashed. Murder. What's next on the list? Adultery. Adultery, which is illicit sexual relations by a married person 
outside of the covenant of marriage, not within the gift and the beauty and the sanctified union of a man and a woman who's given the gift of holy intimacy by God and it's a beautiful thing. No, 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 that's not good enough. We've got to step outside of that. And that desire comes from within. It's an idea. It's an evil thought that when enticed and lured by your own desire, you commit adultery. A married person committing these sexual acts outside of the bounds of their marriage. Next is coveting. Coveting. Which means the desire for things or persons that do not belong to you. A lust for someone else's wife. A lust for someone else's possessions or um, status. Covetousness. The other, the next word is wickedness. What's that? Wickedness. Many ways of evil thoughts that express themselves. The last six words on the list are singular nouns, which point to the attitudes and vices of the human hearts, evil dispositions, dealings with human relationships. The first on the list here is deceit. You also can translate it fraud. It means cunning maneuvers designed to ensnare someone for one's personal advantage. We see this a lot in corporate America, in jobs. We see this a lot even in families. Oh, have I seen it before when, when someone dies and there's not a will or, or there is a will and the executor of the state plans and comes up with schemes, cunningness to take the wealth all for themselves. Oh, I've seen it where they've come in weeks before the loved one dies. Someone who is affected with Alzheimer's and dementia and gets them to sign all kinds of papers and then flies off into the distance and the very family member who's taken care of that person for years now is removed from everything. Their own flesh and blood. Oh, it's disgusting to see and watch. It is a hurtful thing. Where does it come from? Jesus tells us. From within. It comes from within. Next is on the list is what? Envy. Which means an evil eye. A begrudging, jealous attitude towards someone's possessions. Towards someone else's status. Someone gets a promotion. And instead of rejoicing with that person and encouraging that person, you're filled with envy. What's next on the list? Slander. The Greek word is blasphemia. Blasphemia. It's where you get the word blasphemy. It is a defaming, hurtful speech against a person who's created in the very image of God. Slander. To slander your brother or sister. A defaming, hurtful speech against them. Where does that come from? What's next? Arrogance or pride, which means a boastful, exalting oneself above others who are viewed with scornful contempt. That's what the word means. A boastful, exalting of oneself. What's last on the list? What's last, Jesus says here, is foolishness, folly, you know what that translates to? It refers to a person who has no moral judgment at all. No moral judgment at all. The other word in the list here was sensuality. It means lewdness, unconcealed immoral behavior. Yesterday, as my sons and I attended the, South, uh, the Texas State Bobcat game, uh, we had to park. I, I had never been to the games, and I'd never been to the stadium. And uh, so we had to park way, 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 way far off and then walk, walk to the stadium. 
And as we were walking, it, appeared, it became apparent to me uh, that we had walked into the tailgate party of the college students. And my sons had never seen such behavior before. It was very scary to them. And, the, you know, they didn't understand why, why girls would not have any clothes on. Sensuality, which, which is an unconcealed, immoral behavior. A foolishness, having no moral compass at all. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Jesus teaches us that it does not come from the outside. It comes from within. It comes from within. The main point of this passage is that uncleansingness is a moral issue of the heart, not a ritualistic issue of the outside appearance your ability to come to church, your ability to serve the homeless, your ability to pay your taxes, your ability to help your neighbor. All of those are great things. But if your heart, if your heart is not changed, you will stand before God and He'll point to all of these things. What are you going to have? Well, I washed my hands. What were these Pharisees going to have when they stood before God on judgment day? Well, I washed my hands and Jesus' disciples ate with dirty hands. I went to synagogue. I went to church. I gave a tenth of my income. I, I, you know what you sound like? You know what they will sound like? I'll tell you what they'll sound like. Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. For many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not do this or that for you in your name? And he will say to them, Depart from me, you workers of unlawlessness, for I never, ever knew you. As we conclude, let us be sober to what Jesus has taught us this morning. And let us come to grips with who we really are. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 through 10 says something profound. You know what it says? It says that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You see, each man thinks that we're really not that bad. The Bible has a different argument because each man does what's right in their own eyes. They formulate a worldview and an opinion of their own value system. So as long as you don't violate your own opinion, your own system, you're good. But you see, We have to understand that God's system is His prerogative. We don't get to add to it. We don't get to take away from it. We don't get to justify. It is what it is. And it says what it says. And here in Jeremiah, it says that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Point number one. Write this down. There is no outside act that can perform to cleanse your heart. There is no outside work or act or deed that can cleanse this inward condition that I've been preaching about and that Jesus reveals. Don't ever forget that. Because if you forget that, You've now walked away from the gospel and you've now begun a system of works. There is no outside act that can be performed to cleanse your heart. Point number two. 
Point number two. You've got to get this. Sin and evil come from within you. Sin and evil come from within you. You must come to grips with this truth. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that there is no one who does good. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Point number three, there is hope. (laughs) Praise God, there is hope. There is a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And through Him, our hearts can be regenerated. Do you get that? There is a Savior. His name is Jesus. And through Him, our hearts can be regenerated. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 6, Moses told the people of Israel a beautiful promise that still rings true today that one day God Himself will circumcise your heart. He will circumcise your heart. He'll cause you to love God and to obey Him. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, the prophet promised that one day God will remove your heart of stone and He will give you a heart of flesh. He will give you a new heart. He will give you a new heart, removing the old one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a glorious verse says that therefore anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, the new has come. So point number three, there is hope. There is hope for the sinner. There is hope for the evil, wicked heart of mankind. And point number four, through faith in Christ, We are born again. You see, everyone in this gym must be born again. There won't be anyone here that unless you're born again, you'll enter into heaven. For Jesus declared it as a dogmatic truth. Don't ever forget it. He said, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You can't even see it. But through Jesus Christ and faith in Him, we are born again. We are made alive who were dead. We are made new, and we are declared justified before God. God sees the finished product, because some of you may be squirming right now, thinking, well, well, okay, Sean says there's hope in Jesus Christ, but, but I still have some wicked things that come out of my heart. Yeah, me too, me too. But guess what? God sees the finished product with your faith through Jesus Christ, He has seen and sees that you are justified through Christ, His perfect obedience. When on that cross, He said in His dying breath, it is finished. It means that the transaction of your sin was given over to Him and His righteousness is now given over to you and it's finished. There's nothing to be paid for again. It's all paid in full. Through faith, through faith, we become more and more like Christ. How? Through the process of sanctification. You put off the old man. You put on the new. This is a daily thing. This is a daily thing. For, for it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives through me. That's what the Bible teaches. Through the gospel, we are now able to live through Christ and the power of His Holy Spirit, walking according to that Spirit and not gratifying the sinful nature. How do you do it? Through faith in Christ, believing on Him alone, full confidence in His work, and being justified alone in Him, throwing off everything that you would ever hold to yourself That you would stand before God and say, Oh, I I hope that you'll forgive me because of my sincerity of being sorry. That's not hope. You see, I've had people tell me that. God, 
God's going to forgive me because I've said I was sorry for my sins. No. In reality, all you're doing is trusting in yourself. You're trusting in your, your sincerity. No. There's not hope in that. There's not hope in that. Why? Because the human heart is desperately deceitful. See, your own heart will tell you, oh, God knows me. He knows my heart. He knows I'm sorry. But see, what your heart isn't telling you is that God is a judge. And he made a law. And when that law is violated, there is a punishment. And that punishment is called eternal separation in a place called hell, prepared for the demons and angels to burn forever. Your heart don't tell you about that. But through Jesus Christ alone and his obedience alone, we are saved. We are made new. We are given a new heart. We now, instead of like a fish swimming downstream with sin and the world and the world's ways, we now have the ability to say no to ungodliness and to choose to obey God rather than your own heart. How do we know that? Because the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For there is no temptation that has overcome you that is more common than any other man. It ain't just you. You know, the devil will tell you that. No one else has to suffer this type of temptation. No, that ain't true. We all have the same human heart. And if we're honest, just think about it. Not even your actions. Just take your thoughts, things that you have thought before. <clears throat> right? If we're honest, though, we'll know that we have, we have no confidence in ourselves. But it's through that regenerating power of the Spirit that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So therefore, I leave you with this. If you are a Christian, which through faith Anybody, no matter what you've done, anybody comes to Christ, they are saved. This is what you do. You read his word daily. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you walk according to the spirit. And when you mess up, and you will, you repent quickly. And you run back to the cross. And you thank God through the cross not your sincerity of being sorry. Through the cross alone, you thank God for your forgiveness. And you keep marching. And that's what produces joy. Because the devil wants to keep you, oh, I screwed up today. I must not be a Christian. I must still be the old man. No, no, no. Shut your mouth and listen to what it says and move on. Keep walking in his grace. Be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you may, may be doing this and some of you may not. I don't know. The Bible teaches that the weeds and the wheat will grow together. The disciples did not know that it was Judas. They all said, is it me, Lord? So I don't know your hearts, but God does. And I, I reckon you do too. So I implore you this morning, throw yourself upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's pray. 